So how are you guys doing? For those of you that may not know me, I'm Nathan Reimer. I'm the lead pastor here at Kara City Church, and we're glad you're here this morning. Uh, so two weeks from now is Father's Day, and like Sean said, it's Jersey Sunday, so you can wear the jersey of your favorite sports team, whether that's high school, college, or pro. I, God did tell me this morning that if you wear a Dallas Cowboy jersey, there's some special reward in heaven. I don't know what it is. He didn't tell me that. No, wear whatever you are, but I mean, you know, Dallas Cowboys. So um, the other thing is, just as a reminder, we're leaving town on vacation on Saturday, so we won't be here uh, for a few weeks, and we're really excited about that. Uh, Sean and Chris need all your help while we're gone. If you've volunteered, thank you. If you haven't, help them. Just rally around them. Uh, they act like they're not scared. They're not scared at all about me leaving. They're scared to death of my wife leaving. It was so bad that Chris had to take a Sunday off uh, to get ready for it. He's actually preaching uh, a wedding, so he's off this weekend. But uh, anyway, thank you for being here. All right. I'm going to show you guys a few labels, some corporate logos, and I want to see if you recognize them. If you do, go ahead and just say them out. Don't be shy. Just say them. All right, let's look at them together. Here's the first one. Nike, yeah, we all know Nike. How about this next one? Apple, that pretty successful fruit company. And then how about this one? <laughs> Some of you guys are craving a $10 cup of mediocre coffee right now. How about this one? Oh, don't turn on me. Don't do it. I'll have ushers come in next week and pass out an offering plate. I, it's not. <laughs> how about this one? Yeah, there you go. I just played up to the home crowd here. Yeah, we all recognize labels. We identify with labels. And the reality is we have labels too. We have things about us that we've picked up maybe as a kid or more recently that kind of define who we are, that, that show us what to think about ourselves, that uh, show us how to react with other people. And we all have these labels. Like I said, some are all the way back to childhood. I, I picked one up as a kid. I picked up the label geek. I was pretty smart. I was in the, you know, I was in the computer club. I did math leaps. I was the science club. And, and so I was a geek. And girls really wouldn't talk to me unless they needed help with their homework. So now geeky is kind of cool. With Stranger Things and some other shows, it's kind of become a thing. But it wasn't back then. It was just geeky. I, I like to think that I was a trendsetter back then. <laughs> you may have labels that you've picked up all the way back to childhood. They have also gotten some labels more recently. But these labels are powerful. They define who we are. They help us to identify ourselves and they help us to figure out how we're going to interact with other people. And some of these labels are pretty good labels. But others are destructive and they hold us back and tear us down. So I, as we go through this sermon, I want you to think about your labels. What is it about you that sums you up? What are the things that define who you are and define what you think about yourself and how you react to other people? Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, and we're going to be in that for the whole passage and the whole sermon today. We're in the second week of our sermon series called Gospel Talks, where we're looking at these one-on-one -on -one intimate conversations that Jesus had with different individuals. Last week, we talked about the woman at the well, and this week, we're talking about Another character who Jesus just met in that moment. Now, some of you that were in Sunday school as a kid, you've probably heard of this guy. His name is Zacchaeus. It's a great children's story. Some of you may even, how many of you know the song? Yeah, some of you, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. So you've heard it before, but you've never heard it sung like that. <laughs> you can see why they don't let me have a microphone when we're singing. They didn't even know I was doing that. If they'd have known I was singing, they wouldn't let me do it. <laughs> but let's look at his story because he's a great children's story. But Zacchaeus is also a grown man with some pretty serious labels. So as we go through this passage of Scripture, as we go through this story, see if you can identify some of Zacchaeus' labels. Let's look at it together. Verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, Jesus is going to be the guest of a sinner. 
But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, did you pick up on any labels that Zacchaeus has? The first label that Zacchaeus has is limited. That's his label. Zacchaeus had some limitations. In fact, one of them is a physical limitation. Did you pick up on the physical limitation? Zacchaeus is short. Maybe we should be a little more politically correct. Zacchaeus was vertically challenged. Look back at verse 3. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Now, the Bible doesn't use a lot of physical descriptions for people. So when it does, we need to take notice because it's saying something. So I don't think Zacchaeus was a little short. I think he was a lot short. I don't think he was on his high school basketball team. He probably had a bit of a Napoleon complex about being short, although they wouldn't have called it that because Napoleon wouldn't be born for about 1,700 years after that. And being short isn't Zacchaeus' only limitation label. He's also unpopular. So it said he was a tax collector. And, and look, I'm not a big fan of the IRS, but what Zacchaeus was was way different. So Zacchaeus was Jewish, but he worked with the enemy, the Romans. He had a contract with Rome to send a certain percentage of tax back to Rome. But then Zacchaeus and the people that worked for him, they could charge as much tax as they wanted to. The, and then they got to keep all of the money except what they'd contracted with Rome to provide. So their taxes were very harsh. So let me give you an example of how this tax would work. So you could be taxed on goods that you brought into the city. So if you came in to the city with a wagon of wood, of goods, you could be taxed on the goods that you brought in. You could also be taxed on the number of wheels on your cart. You could also be taxed on the number of mules or horses or donkeys that were pulling the cart. So he was not a popular dude. He probably wasn't voted most popular or most likely to succeed in his high school class. He was probably voted most likely to be found in a ditch dead at some point. Zacchaeus was dealing with some limited labels. What's your limited label? Maybe when you were growing up, you were told that you weren't good enough or smart enough or, or pretty enough. Maybe your parents compared you to your brothers and sisters, and when that, they made that comparison, it always felt like you didn't quite measure up to some of the other brothers and sisters. Maybe you were called ugly or fat, and that became your label. And it affects the way you think about yourself all the way to today. Maybe your limitation label is afraid, and you're scared to get out of your comfort zone, and so you don't try new things because you're worried about having failure and not being successful. Maybe you're not as engaged here at church because you're worried about what might happen. Maybe you've never been baptized by immersion because that just makes you a little uncomfortable thinking about those things. Maybe your limitation label is unread, and you don't think you know enough about the Bible to tell somebody about your faith in Jesus. You may not even feel like you know enough to invite them to church because what if they ask you a question that you don't know the answer to? You're not ready for that. Maybe your label is broken and something terrible was done to you as a child or earlier in your life. It wasn't your fault. You were a victim. But that being broken still defines who you are, how you think about yourself, and how you interact with other people. For some of you, you struggle with anxiety and depression. And that's a real problem. It's a real issue but it's a label. It defines who you are and how you interact and respond to others. What's your limited label? You know, many of our limitation labels are real, but some of them aren't even real. They're not even true, but the reality is if you come to accept a label, it's true just like it was real. Let me give you an example. Here's what the Bible says about this in Proverbs 23, 7. It says, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. In other words, what we think our labels are, what we think defines us, becomes who we are. There was actually an experiment done, a sociology experiment, that really shows how this worked. Now, I've used this before, but it's such a beautiful illustration of how we take lies and we make them truth in our own life. So, this sociology experiment is called the SCAR experiment. It works like this. They took 10 individuals and they told them that they were going to test how unsuspecting people react to serious scarring. And so they got Hollywood makeup artists and they put these horrible scars on these 10 people's faces and then they showed them a mirror to show them the scar. 
Then they took the mirror away, and they said they had to put a finishing powder on it to get it to keep from smearing. But what they really did is they wiped the scar off. So they no longer had the scar. And then they sent them out into this room full of people. And and so they let them be out there for about 45 minutes, and then they brought them back in and interviewed them. All 10 of them said people treated them differently because of the scar. They said people were staring at the scar, that they looked uncomfortable and wouldn't look at them, that they treated them a little rudely because of the scar. Remember, there is no scar. These volunteers viewed the encounter through the lens of being scarred. And it affected what they thought about themselves. It also affected what they perceived other people thought and acted towards them. This perception of limitations have an effect on us. Labels are powerful. Even the labels that aren't true. Look back at Luke 19 through uh, 19, 4 and see how Zacchaeus does with his label. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. So Zacchaeus is short. And he wants to see Jesus. Now, Zacchaeus could have just said, you know, I'm not going to be able to see over the crowd. So I'm just going to catch Jesus the next time he comes through town. He could have let his limitation label define him. But that's not what he does. He climbs a tree. Think about this. This dude is one of the wealthiest guys in the city. He has a position of power and authority. Dude climbs a tree. He goes out on a limb, literally, to try to see Jesus. See, he took a chance. He got out of his comfort zone even though he was limited. Climbing a tree in public, that wasn't really consistent with his status in the community. But that's what Zacchaeus does. He wanted to see Jesus, and so he takes a chance and got out of his comfort zone. We all have limitation labels, every single one of us. Some are real, and some are imagined. But either way, They shouldn't affect your relationship with Jesus. You can still have a deep connection to Jesus. You can also make a powerful impact in the kingdom of God. Throughout the Bible, God uses some of the weakest, most flawed, and unprepared people to do some of the most amazing things. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1, 26-31. He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Listen to those credentials for the early Christians. You wouldn't want to put those things on a resume. wouldn't get you hired. Weak, not wise, a failure. That's who they were. God uses those people to do his work. So the fact that you have a limitation label doesn't keep God from using you. I'm 53 years old. Some of you know this, some of you may not. I've only been a pastor for about 10 years. I've been an attorney for 28 years. God called me into ministry again. He called me when I was young, but he called me again around 42. And at that point in time, I had a very successful law practice. I I was thriving in the legal community. I had no experience as a pastor. I had no training. And and at that point in time, I was like, God, I'm too old. I've already got an established life. Things are good. Things are working the way they are. I, I don't have, at this point, I'm, I'm not educated in, in ministry. I don't know what I'm doing. No church is even going to hire me as a pastor. But ultimately, I said yes to God, and he began using me to share his gospel message. Then after I left my last church, I picked up another limited label to go with too old. Because about a year and a half after I left my last ministry, And Lil and I were looking at at houses in in Oregon and and, uh, Wyoming uh, for an early retirement place. And then God started calling us to plant a church here in Katy, Texas. And let me just say that Katy, Texas in the summertime is not nearly as pleasant as Montana. It isn't. We've experienced that. But when he began to call me, I added a new limited label of unprepared. Now I'm too old and unprepared. I have no idea how to plant a church. I've never been a part of a church plant. My my thought is church planters are young preachers who have been through formal training on how to 
uh, plan a church, the strategies of growing a church, how does all that work? They're also supported by church plant ministries or financially supported by big churches. I didn't have any of that stuff. And so it's like, God, I can't do this. For about six weeks, I made excuses for why I was unprepared to handle this ministry. And then when I did, I realized all he needs from me is a willing heart. He, he doesn't need me to be of a particular age. He doesn't need me to have a particular experience level. He just needs me to say yes because he's got the power. Now God's using this limited, flawed person to share his perfect message of hope for a lost world. But you know, that, that shouldn't surprise me. In the Bible, God used the murderer of Christians to write half the New Testament and to be the greatest missionary of all time. He used a fisherman with no formal training to preach a sermon where 3,000 people would decide to follow Jesus that one day. He's used murderers. He's used thieves. He's used prostitutes. All to do his work. God takes the weak and makes them strong. He takes the foolish and makes them wise. He takes the broken and uses them to repair other people. Don't let your limitation label keep you from accomplishing what God's plan for your life. There, there's another label that can define us. That label is failure. We allow ourselves to become defined by our past failures and sin. And that becomes who we are. It defines how we interact with other people. Zacchaeus had this failure label. Look back at verse 2. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. If this verse sounds a little like an indictment when it says he was a tax collector and he became very wealthy, that's because it is. It's saying he was a thief. He was stealing from people. Look down at verse 7 what it says. It says, all the people saw this and began to mutter. Jesus has gone to be the guest of a sinner. That's how they thought about Zacchaeus. That's how Zacchaeus thought about himself. As part of his job, he stole. Now, before we get all high and mighty and we start accusing poor Zacchaeus, we need to understand that every single one of us have this label of failure. One of my failure labels that defines me is prideful. It's a sticker I've got right here. Because when I went to law school and I got out, the number one thing I wanted to accomplish was to be a successful attorney. I wanted to be known throughout Houston, throughout Texas, as a dynamic lawyer. And that defined everything I did. And I was successful. Within three years, I became a partner at the law firm I was at. And I looked around and I didn't see any of my classmates that had that kind of success that quickly. But that success went to my head. I started to feel really good about who I was and what I accomplished. And I'll be honest, that was hard on my relationship with Jesus. Because the whole world began to revolve around me. It was what I thought. What, what, what I thought mattered. What I did was important. It's also really hard on my relationship with my wife. I wasn't much of a parent because, you know, I'm thinking, hey, I work really hard. I make lots of money. She can take care of the kids. And so I wasn't a very good parent. I wasn't a real good husband. I wasn't around a lot. And when I was around, I, I wanted everything to revolve around me. I needed me time because I worked really hard. And, and so I needed the world to revolve around me. I put myself first. So all that mattered to me was me. I lost compassion for people that I didn't think worked as hard as I do or had as much success as I do. And I became very prideful. It became the truest thing about me. What's your failure label? Maybe your label is divorced. It's a long time ago, but it defines how you think about yourself, how you interact with other people, filled with guilt and regret and bitterness. Maybe your label is addicted. You may still be addicted to alcohol or drugs or pornography or gambling, or maybe it was in your past, but it still defines who you are. It is the truest thing about you. Maybe your label is prideful like me, or it's selfish, and you spend all of your time and energy and resources serving only yourself. Maybe your label is damaged. You made a mistake in your past, did something you're not proud of. Maybe you had an abortion, and still to this day, it's a label. It defines who you are. God has so much in store for you than your labels of limitation 
and failure. Let me ask you guys a question. Who has the right to label someone or something? Who's got that right? I would say there's two people that have that right. The first is the maker. Think about Nike. If they make a shirt or some shoes, what do they put on every single one of them? That Nike Swish. They've got the right to label it because they're the maker. There's, there's a second person that has that right, and that's the buyer, the purchaser. They have a right to label it because they own it now. I, I love uh, thinking back to getting a new glove. It was one of my favorite things, a new baseball glove. I played baseball for about 10 years, and I loved i get that new Rawlings glove that had the Rawlings label because they made it. But as soon as I bought it and I got it home, I put my own label on it. I wrote my name in that glove because I didn't want anybody else to have that. It was mine, and I labeled it. Now, you can't just go into academy and start autographing gloves because unless you're an, a Major League Baseball star, that's not called an autograph. Uh, that's called stealing and trespassing. So the maker and the buyer have the right to label something. With that understanding, I'm going to ask you a very important question. Who has the right to label you? The only person that has the right to give you a label is your maker and your purchaser. Let's look at what the Bible says about who that is. This is Psalms 139, 13 through 14. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The psalmist is saying God is his maker. He's also your maker. And then look at uh, the next verse. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Your maker and your purchaser have the right to label you. God is that. The one who made you and bought you is the only one who has the right to label you. God made you and then Jesus paid for you on the cross with his blood. And yet, we pick up all of these labels from other people and from ourselves. These limitation and failure labels. But that's not what God wants. He wants a different label for us. Let's look at how Zacchaeus got rid of his old labels. Look back at verses 4 through 6. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I'm going to stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. So here's what's happening. Zacchaeus is up in this tree out on a limb and Jesus is walking at the front of this huge crowd. And as he walks by, he looks up and says, Zacchaeus, which is pretty cool that he uses Zacchaeus' name, but he had never met him before. But he says, Zacchaeus, get out of that tree. You look kind of goofy. I'm going to your house. Let's talk. Now, what you need to see about this story is that Zacchaeus doesn't initiate the meeting. Jesus does. Zacchaeus is out on that limb, but it's Jesus who comes after Zacchaeus and initiates the conversation. This is the critical moment for Zacchaeus. If this is a sermon about labels, this is the label that changes everything. Met Jesus. That was the moment when Zacchaeus changed. He gave up his labels of limitation and failure. And when he meets Jesus, he's going to be known for something completely different. Jesus pursued Zacchaeus. Jesus initiated the conversation with Zacchaeus. Jesus is pursuing you. He is trying to develop a relationship with you. But Zacchaeus had to do something. He had to get out of his comfort zone. And you do too. You know, Zacchaeus could have said, you know, God, so here's the thing. Jesus, I, I'm really busy. You know, my work's really keeping me busy. It takes a lot of time to cheat people out of their money. So I'm kind of tied up with that. But I'm also coaching Little League Baseball, and that takes up all of my free time. So maybe we could, maybe we could meet up again in a few years when things settle down and get a little slower. That's not what he does. The Bible says he came down at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. Now let's look at what happened to Zacchaeus after he met Jesus. Look at verses 8 through 10. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. 
For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus met Jesus and everything changed. He, he went from being lost to being found. He went from being a person who takes from everyone around him to being t- someone who gives to people in need. He was completely transformed through this meeting with Jesus. And if we meet Jesus, we should be too. Look at how the, the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians five seventeen. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. So I was saved when I was a little kid. But after I got out of law school and I became filled with pride, I kind of quit following the Jesus that I claimed to follow. I still said I was a Christian, and I was a Christian, but I really wasn't doing what I needed to do. I didn't look much like the Jesus that I said I followed. And I picked up this label, prideful. Now, I had some other failure labels too, but this is the one that caused the most trouble for me. But then about 13 years ago, I met Jesus again. And and in that moment, I was changed again. If you are in Christ, you are changed. The old labels are gone, and you take on this amazing new label, changed. If you meet Jesus, you will come away different. And look, I'm not talking about little changes like touch-ups to a model in a magazine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Jesus wants to change you like going from a caterpillar to a butterfly. He wants to completely transform who you are. And if you've met Jesus, you've been changed. Paul doesn't say if you met Jesus, you might change or you could change or you change if you want to. Paul says there will be change. So let me ask you a question. Have you been changed by Jesus? Is the old gone? Are you still living out your labels of limitation and failure? For some of you, you've never met Jesus, and you know it. Like Zacchaeus, you're just kind of living life for yourself, and you're trying to do the things to, to get more money and to have success in this world, but it just feels like everything's not quite right. You need to do what Zacchaeus did. Think about it. Zacchaeus wasn't happy with where he was. He had a lot going for him, but if things were awesome, he'd have just stayed home and thought about how amazing it is that he was as rich as he was. But that's not what he does. Dude climbs a tree as a grown man to try to see Jesus. He got out of his comfort zone. When he climbed that tree, he he didn't know what to expect. He hadn't met Jesus yet. He was just hoping that maybe that moment would make something different in his life. And Jesus completely transformed him. And that's what he wants to do for you too. If you're here today and you're thinking your life's not all it's cracked up to be, you're like Zacchaeus. Well, you got to take a little risk to meet Jesus. You have to take a chance, go out on a limb, and find out more about the Jesus who changes everything he touches. For some of you, you, you call yourself a Christian. You, you go to church and you, you know about Jesus. You, you tell yourself, look, I'm a pretty good person. I haven't killed anybody and I don't cheat on my wife. And you feel pretty good about that. But you recognize You've never really been changed by Jesus. And I'm going to say something that's going to make you a little uncomfortable. But I'm going to say it because I love you and I want you to be transformed by Jesus. If you haven't been changed, you haven't met Jesus. Every person that meets Jesus is changed. Let me tell you what I think is the scariest passage of Scripture in all the Bible. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. He says that at the end of time, on the day of judgment, that lots of people are going to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I know you. And Jesus is going to look at them and say, I don't know you. Depart from me. I never met you. That's a scary thing. See, here's the thing. Knowing about Jesus isn't enough. Playing religion isn't enough. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. If you think you're a Christian because your wife is really involved in church and you come to church some, even though you'd rather be somewhere else, and you're starting to feel real uncomfortable with this sermon, I'm just going to be real direct with you. Have you been changed by Jesus? And if the answer is no, you need to go out on a limb and meet Jesus. Don't let your nervousness and worry about what other people might think keep you from making the most important decision you could ever make. 
Let me ask you a question. Who here struggles with sin? Get them high. We can be, yeah. And for those of you that didn't raise your hand, I know what your failure label is. It's lying. <laughs> We're all broken. We all need Christ to make us new and repair us. I still struggle with my old labels. If I'm not careful, this label prideful, it rears its ugly head again. And it makes an appearance. We all struggle with something. And none of us have it all together. And church has to be a place where we can be free to express that. Because if we don't come in broken, we're not going to be changed and restored. You know, here in the South, we come to church and everything's awesome. That's just we, the way we think we're supposed to do church. Oh, Bob, good to see you. Oh, yeah, no, great. Everything's good. God blesses us. Is he bless- yeah, he's blessing us. That's the way we feel like we want to do church. That's not the way you need to do church. See, we treat church like we treat social media. Have you ever noticed on social media that everybody puts this facade of happiness, right? There's never bad stuff generally. It's always our kid doing something amazing and getting some trophy for participating in something probably. And, or it's us on a beach at some fancy place sipping a margarita, I mean of the virgin variety of course. Or we're there with our perfect friends having our perfect life. That's what we put on social media. Nobody puts a picture of the divorce papers that they were just served with. Nobody puts a picture of themselves crying after they just had a big fight with their spouse. Nobody puts a video of their kids saying, I want to die and I don't want to be in the part of this family anymore. We don't put a picture of an empty pill bottle or an empty bottle of tequila where we escape from our failures and our limitations for just a while. See, those things, that facade that we put on Facebook and Instagram, that's okay for social media but it can't be the way we do church. We have to come in broken for Jesus to fix us. That's how it has to work. If we pretend we've got it all together, we're not going to be changed. If Zacchaeus had just walked along at the back of the crowd going, things are awesome, he wouldn't have met Jesus. And if you leave church today acting like everything is awesome, neither will you. We have to get out of our comfort zone. We're all broken. None of us have it all together. Maybe you're here and there's no doubt you're a Christian. But man, you still struggle with a label of some limitation that you have or some failure and mistake. Our church wants to be here to help you be changed and transformed by Jesus. We're going to do something a little different today. Just a minute, we're going to have a time of response where we're going to have a couple of songs to kind of think through this and and get up and move around, something we haven't done because we haven't had the space before. But I've got this label on that says prideful. And, and, and I want you to take the label that you were given. And, and I want you to think, what is my biggest label of failure or limitation? What's the thing that defines me and holds me back from following Jesus the way I should? And, and I want you to write that on this, hello, my name is, stickers. We, we've all got these labels. Maybe yours is lonely. Don't feel like people love you the way they should, or maybe it's addicted, or maybe it's rejected or unclean. Maybe it's just unchanged because you've never met Jesus. Maybe it's prideful like me. Whatever it is, I want you to write that label of limitation or failure. I want you to put it on that sticker, and then I want to get you to put that sticker on your shirt. I know you're going to have to wear it for just a minute, but I would feel bad for you, except I've been wearing mine during this whole sermon, and I've been telling you about my faults and failures for the last 30 minutes. So I want you to put it on, and then I'm going to ask every one of us to go down to the cross and to take that label and give it to Jesus. See, Jesus died on that cross to take those labels. And then I want to get you to get a new label, the one that God wants for you. Label changed. We've all been changed by Jesus. We're also going to have a time of communion got communion right over here and I want you to take a little extra time today to think about what Jesus did on that cross so that you could be changed as we take that little piece of bread we think about his body that was broken and torn as we drink that little cup of juice we're reminded that his blood poured out so that we could be forgiven set free and changed every time we take communion as Christians we ought to be changed a little bit Because we're recognizing that we still struggle with some of those old labels. 
but we're being reminded again to live in this new label of change. If you've never met Jesus, I'm going to do something. I'm going to go put my label on the cross and get my new label of change, but then I'm going to go take communion. But after that, I'm going to go stand in the back of the room. And if you've never met Jesus, if you've never been changed by Jesus, I'd love you to come back there. And I'd love to tell you about this Jesus that changes everything. If you've never been baptized by immersion because it's just never felt like the right time, it's never been something that you stepped out of your comfort zone and did, I'd love to visit with you about that. If you just need some prayer about some old leg you're struggling with, I'd love to pray with you about that. We're going to have a couple of songs that you can do all these things. We're going to ask that you get up, take your time, think about what your labels are, and then give those to Jesus. You've got about 10 minutes, so don't be in a hurry. Don't feel like you've got to rush. Put some thought into it and decide what it is that holds you back and defines who you are. See, Jesus wants to take away your old labels of sin and failure and limitation and struggle. He wants to make you new and clean and pure. He wants to make you changed. The only question is, will you let him? Let's have this time of response together. chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending promise good to me and his home my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my chains are gone God, my Savior, has ransomed me. In like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone.
my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, in like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending 